Hello, knowledge seekers. In this episode of 20 Minute Books, we dive into the world of Green Illusions by Ozzy Zayner. This enlightening piece takes us beyond the hype and grandeur of new alternative energy sources, bursting the bubble with a poignant insight that pushes us to reevaluate our own consumer behavior. Zerner argues that it is our excesses as consumers that pose the real threat to the environment, urging us to rethink our approach to sustainable living. Zerner, an American author, is a renowned voice in the realm of environmental studies. Not only is he a reviewer for the acclaimed Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, his insights and arguments have found their way into prestigious publications such as the Sunday Times, Wired, and the Washington Post. Green Illusions is an absolute must-read for anyone keen on unmasking the truth behind alternative energy sources. It calls out to all of us who hold the future of our planet close to our hearts. Urban planners, environmental enthusiasts, and conscious citizens alike will find this book's perspective both captivating and necessary in shaping a greener future. So, buckle up as we journey into the profound pages of Green Illusions. Green Illusions, The Dirty Secrets of Clean Energy and the Future of Environmentalism. Introduction, Unmasking the Myths, Digging into the Reality of Alternative Energy Solutions. Imagine a future where the energy demands of the entire planet are fulfilled by natural and renewable sources such as sun and wind. If you're an environmentally conscious person, this might sound like a perfect solution, right? Well, prepare for some surprises as we venture deeper into this topic. The buzz surrounding renewable energy sources tends to overlook some major disadvantages that they entail. But here's the real kicker. You'll come to understand why banking on high-tech answers is essentially a way for us to justify our high-consumption lifestyles. If we were genuinely committed to preserving our environment, we would be striving to reduce consumerism, not encouraging it. In this script, you'll unearth how biofuel is exacerbating food scarcity, why being a little lazy and taking days off work could be beneficial for the environment, and how solar energy might be propelling us towards global warming faster than we realize. Part 1. The Uncomfortable Truth Conventional energy sources are perilous and wreak havoc on the environment. For centuries, the human race has relied heavily on traditional energy sources like fossil fuels and uranium to power our world. But this presents a serious issue. These energy sources are finite, whereas our demand for energy is seemingly never-ending. It's a universally accepted truth among experts that we need to look for alternative solutions. Before we plunge into the realm of alternatives, let's delve deeper into the current primary energy sources that are driving our world. Among conventional energy sources, coal takes the crown as the chief environmental culprit. It's the most prolific producer of carbon dioxide, CO2, a greenhouse gas that is a key contributor to global warming. But that's not all. The combustion of coal results in air pollution, posing serious health risks to humans. Even if we install filters to curb this, we end up with a toxic residue that contaminates groundwater supplies. Plus, coal mining wreaks havoc on landscapes. Regardless of its damaging consequences, coal is still the preferred choice for generating electricity in countries like America and China, making up 50% and 80% of their power respectively, primarily due to its lower cost compared to oil. Uranium, which powers nuclear energy, isn't much better than coal from a risk standpoint. While nuclear accidents might seem less probable than oil spills, the magnitude of the potential damage they can inflict is astronomically higher. This potential for devastation can be triggered either by human error, as witnessed in the Chernobyl disaster, or natural calamities, like the tsunami that led to the catastrophe at Fukushima. The inherent danger of nuclear plants also makes them potential targets for terrorists. Further compounding the problem, nuclear energy production creates radioactive waste, whose storage poses its own expensive and complex set of challenges. 
engineers are still in the quest for a safe and long-term storage solution that can effectively contain the emitted radiation. Despite the environmental health and safety risks they pose, coal and nuclear power continue to be used because of economic reasons. However, an analysis by a subsidy watchdog reveals that their profitability largely hinges on state tax subsidies, suggesting that they aren't economically viable in the long run without such support. Part 2. The Other Side of the Coin Exploring the Unintended Consequences of Alternative Energy Sources Against the backdrop of conventional energy sources, sustainable energy alternatives present a hopeful picture. These are touted as means to meet our current energy demands without depleting resources that future generations might need. This cluster of alternative energy technologies, including solar, wind, water, hydrogen, and biofuels, aims to cut down CO2 emissions and thereby slow global warming. They also strive to reduce our reliance on and consumption of fossil fuels, thereby mitigating their harmful impacts. Broadly speaking, we can categorize alternative energy sources into two types, regrowable energy sources and renewable energy sources, also referred to as regrowables and renewables. But the million dollar question is, are they truly sustainable? Let's first scrutinize regrowables and keep the exploration of renewables for later. On the surface, regrowables seem like an ideal substitute for conventional energy resources that are nearing exhaustion. Take the age-old example of firewood. You chop down a tree, burn it for heat, and in its place, more trees grow. As long as we have trees, we won't run out of this energy source. Contemporary biofuels, such as biomass, biogases, bioalcohol, and biodiesel, function on a similar principle. They convert plant and animal matter into energy and then replenish this matter through cultivation. Presently, biofuels cater to roughly 5% of the United States' energy demand. But, even as biofuels offer potential advantages, their production is fraught with risk. It threatens food security and can even contribute to climate change, contrary to what one might expect. Here's why. Farmers are often tempted to switch from cultivating food crops to producing lucrative biofuels. Experts warn that this shift can drive up global food prices, disproportionately affecting impoverished communities worldwide. Furthermore, biofuel production could actually hasten climate change, negating its intended benefits. In Brazil, for instance, farmers are so driven to produce biofuels that they repurpose sugarcane lands for this endeavor. To compensate for the deficit in food production, they clear rainforests to plant sugarcane. But here's the catch. Food crops like sugarcane are less efficient at absorbing sunlight compared to rainforests, thereby inadvertently fueling climate change. Part 3. The hidden flaws in renewable energy sources like solar and hydropower. In our exploration of alternative energy sources, we now turn to renewables, near-infinite sources such as solar and hydropower. Despite their promises, these too come with significant drawbacks. Let's start with solar energy. The sun is a virtually inexhaustible source of energy. The problem, however, lies not in harnessing solar energy, but in the manufacture of solar cells that are crucial to this process. The production of these cells releases considerable amounts of potent greenhouse gases. Just how potent are these gases? Take nitrogen trifluoride, NF3, for instance. This gas is a whopping 17,000 times more potent than CO2. What's even more alarming is that its concentration in the atmosphere is increasing at a staggering rate of 11% per year. Contrarily, hydropower is a highly sustainable method of energy production. It involves building dams on rivers, which then let water flow through to power turbines. Given the Earth's natural water cycle, once a dam and power plant are constructed, they can provide energy for the foreseeable future. Hydropower currently contributes to about 15% of global electricity production. However, even hydropower isn't devoid of flaws. It can lead to international conflicts, primarily because rivers cross borders. Major rivers such as the Congo, Nile, Rhine, and Niger flow through around 10 countries each. So when one nation erects a dam for hydropower, 
downstream countries might experience water shortages. This could lead to droughts and even hunger, potentially sparking disputes. This dynamic is visible in ongoing disagreements between India and Pakistan, and between Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. Part 4. Sustainability Misconceptions The Environmental Cost of Producing Alternative Energy Sources One common pitfall when considering alternative energy sources is the oversight that, While they might be renewable or regrowable, the mechanisms and procedures involved in harnessing energy from them are not. Let's examine two examples to illustrate this point. The notion of a hydrogen-powered car strikes as the epitome of environmentally friendly transport. It's powered by a hydrogen fuel cell that only emits pure water, which sounds like a dream come true for the environment. However, the reality is far from this idyllic scenario. The production of hydrogen fuel for these cells demands a substantial amount of energy, often more than what the cell eventually generates. To convert hydrogen gas into liquid form, a prerequisite for these fuel cells, you need high pressure and refrigeration. This process consumes large quantities of conventionally generated energy. Alternative conversion methods have proven to be less efficient. For instance, a solar-powered hydrogen production plant set up in California in 1994 could only produce one kilogram of hydrogen in 10 hours, equivalent to a gallon of gasoline. Wind energy also faces similar limitations. The wind itself is undoubtedly a renewable resource. However, the turbines that convert wind into energy are not so eco-friendly. Looking at the entire life cycle of wind turbines, manufacturing, transportation, maintenance and disposal, we find that they demand a considerable amount of conventional energy. Similarly, an assessment of the carbon footprint of wind power plants might surprise you. Intuitively, one might expect that the CO2 emissions from these plants would be lower since the turbines don't emit CO2. But, The catch is that the CO2 emissions during turbine production are so high that they often outweigh the environmental benefits that wind power brings. A study conducted in Manchester, United Kingdom, indicates that two-thirds of the city's wind turbines will result in a net increase in carbon emissions. The only possible solution is to situate the turbines in wind-abundant areas. However, Most of these prime spots are already occupied and only meet 1% of the global energy demand. Part 5. The Allure of Clean Technologies. A False Environmental Panacea? Given the glaring drawbacks of alternative energy sources, one might wonder why there's such a fervor around them. Why do people continue to overlook the negative impacts of these energy sources? The answer lies in our innermost motivations. Firstly, the prospect of new clean energy technologies supporting our current lifestyle, replete with excessive consumption, is irresistibly appealing. If our environmental problems can be solved by scientists and engineers, it means we can continue our unchecked consumerism without guilt or apprehension, right? This is the phenomenon known as having a green conscience, a comfortable delusion that lets us revel in our lives without worrying about the future of our planet. Facing the harsh realities and downsides of alternative energy sources means acknowledging the need for energy reduction, a prospect most people find distasteful. It evokes visions of cold showers, reading by dim light, or enduring the heat in an air conditioner-free bus, among other discomforts. Secondly, a deeply entrenched belief exists that technological advancements can be our savior The environmentalist movements in Europe and the United States since 1970 have heavily backed the idea of ecological modernization, the view that technological progress and innovation can lead to benefits for both the environment and the economy. However, some researchers argue that this belief is a mere illusion, lulling us into thinking we can achieve energy without environmental cost. As one Swedish researcher puts it, the excitement around developments like hydrogen cars and nuclear power stems from this illusory hope. They echo humanity's age-old fantasy of a perpetuum mobile, 
a hypothetical machine that operates without energy. But such machines are physically impossible. Pursuing this dream through hydrogen fuel cells and uranium could prove downright hazardous. Part 6. The Green Mirage. How Marketing Paints an Overly Optimistic Picture of Alternative Energy Sources. Have you ever wondered why almost every politician, media outlet, and company portrays alternative energy sources as the panacea for all our environmental woes? You're not alone in your observation. Green marketing has pervasively permeated public discourse. But why is this the case? Firstly, politicians are attracted by the potential economic boons from novel energy technologies. They perceive the burgeoning alternative energy industry as a promising arena for stimulating economic growth and employment rates. However, there's a more insidious side to this discourse. Modern day journalists often extol the virtues of alternative energy technologies without conducting thorough research. Instead of undertaking exhaustive investigative journalism, they tend to rely on content provided by alternative energy firms and public relations agencies. This phenomenon, known as source journalism, stems from the financial constraints on media organizations that prevent them from retaining an ample number of journalists. As a result, about two-thirds of online journalists claim they prioritize disseminating over scrutinizing information due to cost pressures. The tragic outcome of this process is that journalists often fail to delve into the negatives of alternative energy forms. Furthermore, their strive for objectivity presents its own quandary. Journalists may feel they are maintaining objectivity by reducing the energy debate to a contest between alternative and conventional sources. But in the process, they completely overlook simpler, non-technological solutions like carpooling, cycling to work, and other energy-saving tactics. There's always more than just two perspectives in any debate. Finally, journalists often find themselves under pressure from multinational corporations that endorse alternative energy solutions. A recent study by the Pew Research Center revealed that 68% of journalists working for local newspapers felt that business pressures influenced their writing. This doesn't mean companies are directly dictating journalists what to pen. Their influence is more subtle. Often, it's the companies that finance the studies which journalists rely on for information. Part 7. The irony of technological solutions. Does more efficiency exacerbate the energy crisis? Adding to all the negatives already discussed, alternative energy sources have another significant pitfall. They fail to tackle the true crux of the energy crisis, our soaring demand for energy. Instead, they provide technological solutions that aim to boost energy production or improve energy efficiency. Essentially, they're targeting the symptoms rather than the disease itself. Surprisingly, even an action as seemingly harmless as enhancing energy efficiency can have adverse effects. It can paradoxically drive up rather than reduce our demand for energy. This paradox, known as the Jevons paradox, is named after economist William Stanley Jevons. In 1865, he scrutinized how the invention of a more efficient steam engine by James Watt affected the nation's coal consumption. Though initial effects showed reduced coal consumption, thus improved energy efficiency, in the long run the invention made steam engines more affordable and popular, leading to an increased usage of coal. In a similar vein, Heightening the efficiency of modern machinery and devices will lower energy costs, thereby raising demand for it. In effect, this takes us right back to square one, exorbitant energy consumption and an insufficient energy supply. So, given all these factors, why do we still favor solutions that target energy production over those that address energy reduction? It's largely due to an approach dominant in our economy for a long time called productivism which appreciates produced goods and their manufacturers above all else. This mindset dissuades us from exploring energy-reducing solutions, such as creating walkable communities or commuting by bicycle. Such solutions don't generate tangible products like new wind turbine factories do. Energy reduction strategies generally can't be patented or commercialized and thus don't benefit the economy in traditional ways. Part 8. 
tangible benefits, the secret weapon in inspiring lower consumption habits. It's now evident that the energy crisis isn't rooted in a scarcity of energy, but rather in our rampant energy consumption. This means that each one of us can play a part in mitigating the crisis simply by choosing to consume less. But how can we shift away from our entrenched productivist consumerist lifestyle towards something more sustainable? A major hurdle is that people often lack the capacity to comprehend or care about how their current actions influence future outcomes. Teen smoking exemplifies this. Although teens are warned that smoking can cause cancer, the absence of immediate effects doesn't deter them from picking up a cigarette. The same rings true for climate change. It isn't perceived as an immediate threat, so people struggle to envision the negative impacts. To overcome this behavioral inertia, we should focus on the immediate, tangible ramifications of our actions. Take, for instance, an anti-smoking campaign that highlighted how smokers' breath can ruin a romantic date. This immediate repercussion proved to be far more persuasive than the distant threat of cancer. In the same vein, encouraging people to curtail their energy consumption can be more successful if it's associated with tangible benefits like saving time or money. Supporting this argument is the fact that Europeans, on average, consume less than Americans and also report higher levels of happiness. Americans are stuck in a vicious work-spend cycle. Their consumption levels demand more work to generate sufficient income. For instance, American vacation time has seen an average decrease of 28% over the past two decades. Take another example, the consumption of sweets, snacks, and soft drinks. These have minimal nutritional value, yet one-third of the U.S. food industry's energy consumption is invested in their production. Therefore, if you decide to limit your intake, not only will you be healthier, but you'll also save energy. A win-win situation. Part 9. A governmental push towards energy conservation. The crucial role of policies in shaping consumption habits. Beyond coaxing individuals to alter their consumption habits, the U.S. government can take action to economize energy on a macroeconomic scale. To be effective, these strategies should aim to decrease energy consumption and increase well-being, without imposing exorbitant costs. The first move should be a taxation overhaul. Instead of focusing on income, the tax system should target consumption. As of now, the prices of goods do not truly represent the environmental costs of the energy needed for their production. This misrepresentation must be rectified. Taking a page from California's book could be a good start. In this state, price penalties were imposed on high energy consumption products, resulting in a remarkable outcome. Over the past decade, nationwide per capita energy consumption has doubled, while California's has remained steady. Despite this energy austerity, California continues to rank among the top 10 happiest states in America. The second course of action should be a government-backed drive towards smarter packaging. Consider that packaging material makes up around a third of Americans' trash. The energy required for producing, recycling, and disposing of all this material is staggering. To address this issue, the U.S. could take a leaf out of Europe's book and mandate manufacturers to cover the cost of recycling and disposal of their product packaging there's another compelling reason to compel companies to redesign their packaging. Over 300,000 Americans end up in emergency rooms each year due to injuries sustained while unpacking a product. Finally, the government should legalize and enforce the use of no junk mail please stickers on mailboxes, much like European governments do. This could significantly curb the energy squandered on producing unwanted junk mail. One expert approximates the carbon footprint of all American junk mail to be equivalent to 11 coal-fired power plants. Part 10. Social Strategies. Harnessing Societal Measures to Rein in Consumption. One undeniable factor driving global energy demand is population size. More people inherently mean more energy consumption. This has led many environmentalists to advocate for policies aimed at reducing birth rates. However, as women's rights activists point out, such a strategy risks reducing women to mere biological functions. 
neglecting their right to control their own reproductive choices. Fortunately, emerging environmental strategies are looking to bridge this divide by empowering women instead of imposing technocratic birth rate policies. Research indicates that governmental efforts towards educating and empowering women lead to lower average birth rates. In this way, the goals of environmentalists and women's rights advocates can merge harmoniously. Another social avenue for reducing energy consumption lies in protecting children from the relentless onslaught of advertising. These pervasive child-targeted ads are cultivating a new generation of young consumers. However, shielding children from these ads is easier said than done. How do parents keep their children away from ads? How do they impart the critical mindset necessary to resist consumerism? In 1970, the U.S. Federal Trade Commission and Federal Communications Commission attempted to ban advertising aimed at children. Unfortunately, corporate lobbyists successfully lobbied Congress to squash this move. Contrast this with Sweden, where all advertising directed at children under 12 was banned two decades ago. Current studies suggest that this policy has curbed children's tendencies towards consumerism. Evidence? In their letters to Santa, Swedish children tend to request fewer Christmas presents than children in countries without such advertising restrictions. Part 11. Urban Living A greener choice compared to suburban lifestyles. When considering an eco-friendly lifestyle, the stereotype of a quaint house nestled in the countryside or suburbs often springs to mind. However, this rings true only if one adopts a self-sufficient lifestyle independent of transportation. Typically, suburban living has a significant environmental drawback, the necessity to cover long distances by car for day-to-day activities. As America has increasingly sprawled into suburban spaces, the average time Americans spend in their cars has skyrocketed, doubling over the past 30 years to 45 hours each month. Given this reality, it's actually city living that turns out to be greener, as cities are typically more walkable and offer a variety of public transportation options. Consider New York City, North America's most densely populated region. Despite the masses, it records the lowest per capita greenhouse gas emissions. The reason? New Yorkers lean heavily on walking and public transportation, compared to other North American city dwellers. Cities also tend to be more conducive to cycling. While Americans make less than 1% of their journeys by bike, Germans clock in at nearly 10%, and the Dutch lead the pack with nearly 25% of their trips made by bike. Some may argue that vast distances in the US make cycling less viable. But interestingly, 90% of car trips in the US cover merely one to two miles. If we could encourage more people to swap their cars for bikes and public transit, we could drastically reduce the need for parking spaces and garages in cities. This newfound space could be repurposed for public parks or other green spaces, benefiting both the environment and providing residents with greener surroundings. Shaping cities into more sustainable, livable spaces is a formidable challenge for future environmentalists. The goal? Make city living so appealing that it eclipses the allure of the suburbs, A promising starting point would involve expanding sidewalks, planting trees, establishing safe bike lanes, and creating an abundance of new parks and pedestrian-friendly zones. Final summary, the overarching message of this book. In our quest to safeguard the planet and address the energy crisis, we shouldn't rely solely on the emergence of technological breakthroughs that would enable us to continue our rampant energy consumption. The need of the hour is to foster a culture of mindful consumption, drastically curbing our energy use. Thank you for joining me today on this journey of learning and discovery as we explored the insights of another thought-provoking book in our growing library of knowledge. If you've enjoyed our time together, Please take a moment to follow our podcast, give us a five-star rating, and share 20-minute books with other knowledge seekers. Your support truly means a lot. Don't forget to join me again in the next episode, 
where we will delve into another enriching book. Until then, happy reading and happy listening.